That's something you'll never take, no debate It's gotta be in you to endure the hate and elevate If I love you, then we gon' eat, even if we shed a plate Strive for greatness and try to be more like Harris Bank Young as that, whoever at the top, we coming next Don't care what it is, we conquer all with no regrets It's no wonder when we come on your set, they show respect I don't overstep, we taking off like Boeing Jets You know the rep, and if you don't, you better ask about me I done made it to that skyline I seen out of Abla housing Got goals and accomplishments, the new chick I got Arousing. She say she don't drink it yet every cup I pour she down in Maybe cause she think I'm scouting every season cuffing season I won't do you dirty unless you take me to the cleaners I'll be sure to show each and every reason before I leave you Guaranteed to make you rethink your actions and start believing I got That's something no one can uh, Hello everyone, this is Dr. Malik Rahim again We're talking uh, with some of my great colleagues and friends I was excited to get them onto my uh, video podcast um, Dr. Tanisha Guy was one of my instructors at Chicago State, and this brother here, Brother Steve, is one of her co-hosts on her radio show, um, so I won't do it any injustice. I'm going to let them tell you all about their radio show, but I know it comes on on Sundays at 4 o'clock Central Time, 5 o'clock Eastern, and 2 o'clock Pacific. So, Dr. Guy, Brother Steve, you want to uh, let everyone know a little bit more about your show? Um, hello, um, thank you for bringing me on to your show and thank you for coming on my show as a guest and just even chiming in when you have your commentary. Um, but I am the host of Dr. Guy's Gumbo Talk and I don't even know how many years we've been going now. Right? Off and on, I'd say almost 10 to be honest with you. It's, it's been a while, off, off and on. And so the, the premise behind Gumble Talk is that we talk about everything. So there's nothing that's off limit. If you think about your own uh, pot of gumbo, you kind of throw whatever you want in there. If you make it a uh, seafood gumbo, if it's a chicken. And so that's really kind of what we talk about. We talk about um, religion. We spend a lot of time with relationships. <laughs> um, we talk about mental health, medical health, uh, uh, literally anything that you can imagine that you're either talking about already, or I think we also try to choose topics that people are not talking about to get them engaged in the discussion. And so uh, there are two clinicians on the show, myself and Fatima. Uh, she is uh, our marriage and family therapy specialist. And then we have wonderful Steve. And so Steve and I, for the most part, have a difference of opinion on almost everything, um, but we have a lot in common. And so Steve and I went to undergrad together, so we go way back. So I get comments after the show like, where'd you find Steve at? And I'm just like, uh, 20 years ago? And so I'm going to let Steve uh, describe the show um, from his perspective. Well, you uh, did a very good job of really telling everybody what the, the core topics are. We do explore a lot of current events as well. If there's something that pops up, you know, whether it be the Harvey Weinstein, the COVID-19, you know, we try to stay abreast of things that people may need to know about or um, things that they may not know they need to know about. I think right. what makes it very interesting is like you spoke about our dynamic. You are classically trained and educated, you know, with your PhD. And, you know, I have uh, my degree from Bourbon Street, like I like to tell everybody. So I have a little bit of a different perspective in some places and things that are not generally written down in books or have not been written down thus far. <laughs> well, one of the things I, I really enjoy about your show, um, whether I agree with the, um, the commentary or not, it always is thought provoking. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really, really liked was that uh, there's no hold bar. So I kind of wanted to bring you all on to kind of have everyone hear you all's perspective on some of the dynamics that go on in interpersonal relationships. And one of the first things I wanted to kind of bring up was the whole concept of masculine and feminine energy as far as what is masculinity, what is femininity, and what, how does that impact relationships and gender roles within the relationships? So it's like, um, we're going to have a little brief talk, not taking up too much time, but you know, if one of you all can kind of talk to us, what is your definition of masculinity? I know um, Brother Steve was talking a lot about, you know, the different uh, elements of masculinity. So, you know, kind of share uh, some of your uh, theories with us and your uh, observations. Well, definitely. Um, in any relationship, whether it's same sex or not, there's going to be a masculine component and a feminine component. 
generally your masculine component is going to be the one that's more the protector, uh, more of a provider, not necessarily is nurturing. The feminine component is generally more nurturing in that regard. Although they can be some elements that are interchangeable, but generally speaking, you know, those are going to be their, your primary roles. Um, now, what has tend to happen since, I want to say, perhaps desegregation um, and women getting the ability to vote and have credit and things of that nature, which there's nothing wrong with that. They have become to assume a lot more of the roles that was traditionally held for the man. Now, if the man was not there or whatever the case may be, roles the women to occupy. And you'll find some confusion in relationships now between men and women because because women can have the ability to do things now that they didn't previously sometimes men are a little confused about what they should do when they're dating these empowered women okay interesting interesting so dr guy mm -hmm. um <laughs> i don't even know where to begin um, Brother Steve have a very interesting observation on relationships. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that I'm not saying he's wrong, I'm not saying he's right, but I think it's a, a perspective that really needs to be heard. And I think a lot of times uh, individuals don't actually listen to the contrarian view as far as like I hate to use the word contrarian, but I can't think of another term off the top of my head. But the view that is not so, I guess, politically correct. Um, because um, he said he has his degree from Bourbon Street. So he's one of the common brothers, in other words. And he kind of brings a barbershop type lecture to the show. So what is your view as far as um, deconstructing masculinity and femininity as far as when it comes to interpersonal relationships? You know, I, I think if we were to look at a timeline, historical timeline, we would see the definition, I think, transforming, at least in, in my head, that's what I would envision it as. Um, when I think about masculinity and femininity, there are characteristics that are ascribed to a specific gender. Whether they're right or wrong, I'm not saying that, um, it's up to the individual, but um, for example, being assertive is considered a masculine trait. Um, so the, the, the first example that comes to mind is in the workforce. So if you have a female who's in the workforce and she is climbing the corporate ladder, for example, and um, she does the same exact thing that her male counterpart does. Because he is a man and he is supposed to exhibit certain qualities because they are identified as masculine, he's a go-getter and he's on his way up to the top. But because she's a woman and she exhibits, quote unquote, these masculine tendencies, then she's called aggressive or something else outside of her name. And so I, I think Sometimes these um, characteristics can roll over to become stereotypes that we've placed on each other about what's considered masculine and what's considered feminine. And it pigeonholes, I think, certain people into believing these are the characteristics that I have to have if I'm a male, these are the characteristics I have to have if I'm a female to, to be acceptable. Now, I think in 2020, people are really getting uh, outside their comfort zones and the definitions or the terms look more fluid. I think you have more women that are very comfortable um, owning what we used to consider masculine tendencies or characteristics. And I think you have a lot of men who are owning what we consider to be feminine characteristics and they're okay with it. And that's okay. It should be okay with other people, but because we're stuck in our traditional models, I think it bothers individuals and they want to put other labels on them when they go outside of what they're comfortable well, I, I know I have witnessed a lot of what you're speaking of in academia with um, young ladies, sisters, you know, almost having to wear a mask. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 and when, they're, when, they're, when they're trying to move up the ladder, they got to they gotta not only 
I come because they not they gotta not only fit the bill as a scholar, but at the same mm -hmm. time they gotta make sure that they don't appear too, as you say, aggressive. Mm -hmm. Because the same characteristics for a male would be assertive and you know, they're they're usually allowed to play the quote unquote game a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Um and so it's like I, I do totally agree with that. Um I know you all had a topic where you all were discussing gender roles. And I know masculine and feminine energy is a little different from gender roles, but mm -hmm. it's like, how does that masculine and feminine energy, Dr. Guy, because Steve kind of answered it, but how does that kind of fit into, in a personal relationship? You kind of answered on the career path and the troubles that a lot of sisters have as far as career path, if they're seen as being too um, masculine, is the 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 reframing for a woman is always negative mm -hmm. but how does that impact her as far as her relationships mm -hmm. how does that uh, how does that dynamic kind of impact their relationships i think it greatly impacts relationships i want to go back to what steve said that um obviously there are things that have happened that have given women um like the right to vote and as a result of that women moved outside of the home and into the workforce and so i think just those dynamics we're, we're seeing them play out today in relationships for example women are they're making more efforts or making more strides to build their careers and so in building their careers it takes what we have traditionally called these masculine characteristics be able to do that but along i think masculine characteristics and energy is something that's different but because you're exhibiting these characteristics i think you create and you give off this energy so you give off what people perceive as masculine energy so if i'm a woman and i'm dating a man but i give off this masculine type of energy and this man is a straight heterosexual man i don't think he's going to be attracted to that i don't care how fine you are i don't care how big your booty is like he don't want to be around a woman who gives him masculine energy. Um, and the same goes for, for men and women. Um, I think, again, men are doing a great job of embracing their authentic selves. And that may come with some feminine, what we could consider characteristics. But if you give off feminine energy to a woman, she might not be as attracted to you. And what comes to mind is a, a client and she talked about this guy who was really great. But she was like, he just cried too much. I mean, like he, he just cried over everything. And I was just looking at her like, he can't cry. She was like, over everything? She was like, no, he can't cry over everything. And so I'm not saying that crying is for women only, but she equated his sensitivity to- Weakness. Yes a feminine characteristic and it gave off feminine energy to her it wasn't a masculine energy that she was giving off that he was giving off in the relationship i think it greatly impacts dating uh what if it's going to lead to marriage um because you think about energies and i'm glad that you asked about energy because i talk about energy when i'm in session with clients all the time this is one of the reasons why even though i'm glad we're able to use things like telehealth during COVID 19 I really miss face-to-face -face counseling because I can't necessarily feel your energy through the internet, right? Versus I can see it and kind of try to ascribe to what it is that you're dealing with. But when you walk into my office, I immediately feel energy. Like I can tell if clients had a really horrible day, um, if they had a great day, if they're in an apathetic state, and I literally feel it. Like the hair stick up on my arms, the, the, the temperature changes in the room for me. Um, and so there's something about energy that is genuine, it's authentic, and whether it is masculine or feminine, it depends on the individual. I think women carry masculine energy and they feel like they have to because you have to be able to survive and so if you ran around in your feminine energy all the time you wouldn't get things done and so i think the heart and, and you guys are men so you can explain this to me as a woman the challenge is making the switch when do i need to exhibit more of my femininity feminine energy versus i need to give off my masculine or masculine energy. And I think that's the hard, the hard um, thing that you're looking at in relationships is, do I make the switch? Am I even aware that I need to make the switch? And do I want to make the switch? Um, I remember years ago, 
uh, when I was getting ready to do my dissertation, I saw a picture, right? And the picture um, was a young lady who was holding up her um, dress, trying to hold up her dress and it looked like they'd been ripped off. And she mm -hmm. was talking to a black male. They were like at Bow River. He was talking to a black male. He looked kind of muscular. And she was pointing toward some white men who looked like they were um, maybe like either slave traders or slave chasers. And she appointed them. And the commentary under the picture said, women have lost faith in the black man because we weren't there to protect her. And it did it said, black men have lost faith in a black woman because she betrayed them and went to the white man. Well. Right. And and so and so it's it almost like equated to where it's like the the raping of the black woman was like the black man looked at it like you didn't do enough to protect yourself, and the black woman looked at it to where it was like you didn't do enough to protect us, right? And and it's almost like what as a dynamic as a community can heal those wounds. Because I think those wounds are still there, right? Because it's almost like I hear sisters say what they want in a male, but that usually is not what they go out and try to find, right? Yeah. And then I hear brothers say what they want in a sister, but that's usually not what they go out and try to find, right? <laughs> um, and I've heard in your, in your show that this kind of topic has been kind of touched on, the incongruency on what is being said and what is being done, especially in our community. So it's like, do any one of you all want to kind of speak on that? Like the incongruency on what's being said by one group but not being followed through. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll jump in this uh, real quick. Now, um, we've, we've also talked about this in the past, Dr. Raheem. Uh, one of the things you look at from a historical standpoint from, and I believe I'm familiar with the the photograph you were talking about. I think it might have been by Walk or some one of those yeah, artists. Yeah. So um, historically speaking, the slave traders did pit us against each other. Exactly. Um, for the black male, he was given his freedom if he was able to sire a certain amount of children. And that put him in direct competition with the female who had been left after he sired. I believe it was five. And I think a woman was granted her freedom after 10, if I'm not mistaken. You know, it could have been on a plantation by plantation basis, but these are the things that put us directly opposed to each other for generations. And even now, you know, if you look at what happens in the workforce or what plays out in society is, you know, women are quick to go to HR or call the police. Okay. Um, instead of working some of these problems out because that is, you know, the same, same as going to the master or, you know, quote unquote, the white man, or however you want to put it to, to get the man back in line. You know, even in the sixties, you know, when a, a black woman would have a problem with her husband, she'd go to his, his boss at his job and tell him, you know, Hey man, you need to get in line. So I think those things are still being played out even as we speak. Now, as it goes to relationships, um, it's a little different. And I'll speak to what you were talking about earlier as it relates to the, the, the roles. Um, what you'll find, and I can speak to probably maybe Generation X, um, you find a lot of women who were sold a bad bill of goods. They were told, go to college, don't be a hoe, keep your cookies to yourself, you know, uh, get your education, you get a job, and then you'll be able to get more Boris Kojo. But you know, as we know, there are only a certain amount of Boris Kojos out there. And now a lot of them are just, to be honest with you, bitter that they don't have a Boris Kojo. Um, and now they have expended a lot of this energy competing. And I think that's something that we don't give enough credit is that black men and black women are competing for the same job, but we can't compete the same way. If a woman gets aggressive with me at work, I can't pull her to the side and have a conversation like I might have with a man because that's gonna be interpreted as threatening, bullying, intimidation, whereas that just is generally how men communicate. Also, you know, when it comes to physical labor 
in the workplace. You know, there are certain things that she can get away with that I can't, you know, and it, in the same token, how we talk about how women are treated, how am I looked at if I leave Jan in there with all of the 50 pound file boxes to put on the shelf? You know, it's like, oh, Steve, you were wrong for that. So, I mean, I think it goes both ways. But ultimately what Dr. Guy and I talk a lot in the show is what they think they want is not what they want to need. You know, you think you want a successful man because in your mind it looks a certain way. You think he has time for family, but he's really busy because he's successful. So, um, you know, we talk about the certain types of men that women need to date. Well, some of them do at least. You know, they need to date an older man. They need to date a man who's most sexually experienced. They need to date a baller or a football player, somebody with that body that they go crazy over for them to understand is that something that they can put up with or they're willing to deal with. So you kind of have to go through these, these situations and scenarios as women. And by and large part, men are a little different because men date who they have the ability to date. So, you know, you may never get the opportunity to date an Amber Rose because you're not in those circles. You don't have the intelligence your finances don't dictate that. So I think that at a certain point, men are a little bit more conscientious of what they actually can um, end up with. Dr. Guy, do you think, I don't know if you want to respond to that, but another question is, do you think black romance, black couples, black love is in a crisis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do want to kind of go back to what Steve, something Steve said in that original question. It, when you said it, I immediately thought about a conversation that keeps coming back up for, for Steve and I is the idea that Black women don't feel like Black men have protected them and are protecting them. And so we, we talked about that several times and like, where's that coming from? What do they need? Um, like Black women, I think, feel like they're out there on their own. And we did a show a while back, The Angry Black Woman. And that was kind of some of the things that came up. Like people want to stereotype Black women as being angry and aggressive, but some of them got a reason to be angry and aggressive. Um, some of them have been left alone by black men um, and continue to be left alone by, by black men and not to blame all black men because there are some awesome and great black men but I think those are case by case basis and so the women carry that um, and when we talk about transgenerational curses whether people believe it or not some of us are carrying that like getting back to slavery we're, we're still carrying it it looks very different in these times that we, we're still carrying the same ideology the belief systems attached to um, being stripped apart from the black man and the black woman and what that looked like. And so I think even today, we don't see each other as partners. We see each other as um, competition. And so when we get into relationships with each other, we're, we're competing, whatever we're competing for, but we're competing. And so we're not working together. We're not building empires together. We're not, um, you know, your question was about, is, the, is, the, the, is romance for the black family in danger? I say yes. That today, even when I was teaching at Chicago State, which was 2005, um, I looked at um, why aren't Black people getting married? And that was over 10 years ago. And so it was alarming to me of uh, the reasons why we were not getting married. And not because we didn't you know, want to have this, but because in many cases we hadn't seen it. So we really didn't know what it looked like or two. Um, we would get in relationships and didn't know how to maintain the relationships, or three, kind of going back to what we we're talking about, that women would come to the relationships with a very different type of energy, whether we call it masculine or not, um, and, and men didn't want that. And so one of the things that came up, um, and we did focus groups in different states, and one of the things that came up is across the board, women said, I don't need a man. And across the board, Black men say we just want to be needed. And so there seems to be this huge contradiction between what couples are wanting in their relationship. So how is it that as a Black man, you are um, saying, I want to be needed, but you're with someone in a relationship who was like, I don't need you, Joe. I pay my own bills. I buy my own car. I own my own house. I take my own trash out. So what you here for? Right, like that was kind of the mentality. And in fact, those were the statements that women were actually saying. Um, and so you begin to see a change in some of the statements from the older women and the younger women. So the 20, the 30, maybe even some of the 40s were still saying, I don't need a 
died. But by the time they got late 40s and 50s, they were like, look, I don't need him, but I want him. Right. Um, and so they could at least acknowledge that they wanted him. The, the younger group was like, I don't need him. I'm good without him. And so that's how my life's going to look. And that is how your life looks. And that's why you're in this group, because you're single. And we're trying to find out why, as a community, even though the overall marriage rates have gone down across the board, why people still get married. The numbers are still going up. Even at not the same rates, but still going up. Rates they ain't going up as African Americans. So how do we fix that? How do we solve that issue? I mean, is it as simple as understanding the constructs of gender roles and masculine and feminine energy? Because I, 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 I'm, I'm still stuck on the incongruency, and you kind of spoke on it, Dr. Guy, the incongruency of, you know, I don't need a man. But at the same time, Men saying, I just want to feel needed. I just want to feel wanted. Mm -hmm. So it's like that incongruency, we're never going to get together. Mm -hmm. um, the incongruency Steve spoke about of, you know, the as he put it, being sold a pipe dream of going to school, getting your Boris Kojo, um, and then coming out, find out you're not going to get that Boris Kojo. Yeah. I, I think the, the first question that you led with is it a simple fix is no like it, there's no simple fix in it at all I think that's the challenge while we continue to see the disparity in the number of African Americans that are getting married but I, I think about a personal experience that I had and I was doing my PhD work and I'm in a, in a room full of all Caucasian women and they're just chit-chatting away and so um, a couple of the ladies says, oh, I can't wait to get my MRS. Now, at this point, I had my LPC, and I was working towards my LPCS, and I had my NCE, and I had an MA, and I had a BA, and so I was like, MRS. I'm sitting in the room looking like an odd duck, and they're like, yeah, when I get my MRS, and I can't wait. And they literally just kind of had this conversation. It felt like for years. I just kind of sat there and think, did I miss a license? Did I miss a degree? What are these women who are all getting their PhDs, what are they talking about the MRS? It didn't dawn on me, you guys. It literally didn't dawn on me. Like my head, I was in a different head space. He's half his time about having a husband. <laughs> and I was like, that's it. Like, that's the reason. I think when we really get to the root of it, why many of us that look like us are not pursuing marriages because when you just think about culture and experience, these women, that was all they knew. Like their mothers told them, don't go to school to get a degree, go to school and find your husband. My parents didn't tell me to go find no husband. It's like, you better go get a degree. You better be able to make some money. You better be able to take care of yourself, right? Like it was a different ideology that I received. And so when you say, how do we change? I think we have to reprogram an entire generation, right? Like we have to begin to reframe how we see relationships, and how we see relationships with each other. Brother Steve, what do you think of the solution? Oh man, I have so many solutions for you, but I, I'll give you the, the easiest one is the one that Dr. Guy is speaking to is the, the younger generation is watching the older female generation and they don't want no parts of them problems that they see. They're educating themselves. They're more feminine. Um, you know, they're more like, and we talk about energy, you know, and this is uh, something I believe Newton said or Einstein, that you can only have one thing that occupies the space at one time. And that's really true in a relationship. You can only have one masculine. So um, I'm speaking this and I may be wrong. I think that's part of the reason why you see more same-sex couples is that you have so many women that occupy the masculine that those men who are on the fringe of being masculine get pushed over into being feminine um yeah. which there may be some research to to see that or not i'm just going off my degree off bourbon street um and also you know there there are several movements that you know the men have and a lot of it deals with just dating submissive women like you know we don't have to go and hammer 
the stone and turn it into a sculpture. You could just let the stone fade away. So for those people that are not going to learn the lesson or not going to come into their femininity, you know, you just leave them alone and you they they feminine. I mean, and that's why you see a lot of uh, inter interracial relationships. You know, you see the movement of a lot of men going to to South America to to date Asian women as well, is because that's something that's more in their culture is there is a space for the masculine that's respected rather than me having to sit and argue with this woman to get her trust or her approval, which may be waning from moment to moment, depending on what she's going through. You know, there is something inherent to about just Western culture. If you just think about, and I've talked to Dr. Guy about this, there's more of an understanding of the masculine in other cultures because of the way the language is set up. You're constantly reminded of what's feminine and what's masculine. You know, right. how you should speak and to the her or not. The, the, the cases, yeah, the language. You know, whether everything here is, you know, what's up dog, man, cat, you know, it's not, not gender whatever, specific. It's not gender specific, it's not different cases. So, you know, that's something that's a lot more in, engraved in the cultures from what my dating experience has been. So um, you can just go ahead and kind of uh, breed it out of out of the culture or, you know, for those people that are, are astute enough, I believe, I, I think there's a young lady in Texas that does a femininity coaching. You know, you have to understand what the problem is first. You know, for women, a lot of it has been based upon work. That is how we in America determine who's masculine is who's got the best job, who's working. Like if we look back at, at history, you know, we went from a manufacturing economy, you know, where the man got a big piece of chicken, not because he deserved it, but because he was the engine of the household and he needed to work physically to support the household. And a job in Detroit back in the 60s could support a family and put people through college. That's not the case anymore. Now we're at a, a place where we're more a service or an intellectually based economy, which anybody can do, but we have to be smart enough to know, you know, like I tell Dr. Guy all the time, and you know, y'all get on me this all the time, like a vagina can wear pants, but it works better in a skirt. Like you have to be astute about how to allocate your resources. You know, I can lift something heavy, you can too, but I'm built to lift it more times than you. So let me do this because that's the best use of our energy instead of, you know, being in a situation where we want to do everything and we want to maintain and control. And I think that is leading to a lot of the issues, you know, in relationships, domestic violence, you know, a lot of things. <laughs> You know, I got to say something, right? Say something, Dr. Guy. You said that um, you kind of miss telehealth. You kind of miss person-to-person -person com com counseling because you can't feel the person's energy anymore. I think you got to get a little bit more empathetic because I can feel your energy coming through as Steve kept doing his dissertation. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's energy or facial expressions, right? <laughs> you, you, you should be able to feel how sincere I am when I say these things. So, go ahead, Dr. Guy. I'm not saying I disagree with anything that he says because I rock my dresses probably 90% of the time. I'm not disagreeing with that part, but what I want to say is that um, the concept between femininity, masculinity, feminine, and masculine energy, if you ask a woman sincerely if she wants to be the one who wears the pants, goes to work, has to cook the bacon, like if you ask her, wholeheartedly do you want to have to do it all i promise you she is going to say no i don't i want some help like at her core like she may not tell this to her girlfriend she may not post it on social media but at the core don't nobody want to be doing this all by themselves definitely not as a woman like something as simple as taking the trash out like obviously we can do these things we do them but do we want to have to keep doing them by ourselves for the rest of our lives no but what happens is women i think take a chance with whoever this guy is and they put themselves out there and in their mind and this only needs to happen one time and this is what i think creates the shift in their head this is at one time they put their heart into it they do the switch they're in their femininity i mean they giving him all a she 
and it goes wrong and it goes terribly wrong and they're wounded and they're hurt and they're broken and it doesn't matter if it happened at 16 if it happened at 25 35 45 or 50. once it happens to them it tells them oh no i cannot trust men and i cannot trust that you will be there for me so they continue to function in the masculine role and the masculine energy because what happens is you don't want to get comfortable and then all of a sudden he didn't go to you so now i didn't adapt to you being there and helping me and supporting me and i'm all into my femininity and now you gone now i got to get back into this role that i'm no longer a comfortable land of being masculine and this masculine energy that i gotta give off i gotta switch over to it not because i want to but because i'm forced to, because you've now left the relationship for whatever reason and so instead of having to do the switch women don't want to because they can't trust that they're not going to have to do it um i, I currently teach at wilberforce but i used to teach at fresno state and when i taught multicultural counseling class at fresno state i will talk about all the dynamics um i will talk about them individually but not like they were intersectionality because i mm -hmm. wanted to make sure they had a clear understanding of everything and whenever i got to gender i would tell them a story i would tell my students to close their eyes and as i'm telling you the story just imagine like it's happening so i say you you I, I just let you out of class and as you walk into your car you see two people buy a car and you notice the car is on flat. And the male is standing up, looking down at the flat and the young lady is down with the, um, the crowbar trying to change the tire. I said, now open your eyes. What do you feel about that man? Right? And when they're totally honest, what they'll say is, I think he's weak. But before that, they'll say a woman could do anything a man could do. And it shouldn't be no gender roles. It shouldn't be, you know, a man's job is this and a woman's job is this. It should be everybody should be able to do the job. It would be a meritocracy, whoever could do the job the best. And I say, I agree. But I said, but we still have these internalized gender roles. And they'll tell me, no, 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 Dr. Brian, you're wrong, you're wrong. Then I tell them that story. And if you really thought about it, I tell them that I have a bias. If I mm -hmm. saw my brother doing that, I would get out of the car and curse him out. How do you not know how to change a flat? Because that's my bias, that a man should be able to change a flat. A man should be able to protect a woman, whether that woman is his girlfriend, significant other, his friend, he should be able to protect that woman. Part of providing is to be able to do some things that she's not able to do and should not want her to do. Just like Brother Steve said, you know, very, 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 you know, distinctly that it's, it's certain things that a man could do is like picking up boxes. But a woman might, well, she might can do it, it's not necessarily a good idea, right? So the thing is, and I know I'm paraphrasing kind of what he said, trying to clean it up for my viewers. <laughs> but the thing is, is that we still have these internalized stereotypes and stereotypes as far as gender roles that we have inside of us. And until we, you know, I know I hear a lot of people talk about like toxic masculinity, toxic femininity, uh, alpha males, things like this, right? And why those dynamics might be true the thing is that we still got to cleanse ourselves of understanding what these gender roles are and do they have significance when it comes to our relationship because like mm -hmm. you know, God, if, uh, if most women if you ask them honestly they're going to say they don't want to do certain things mm -hmm. they forced to do it but they don't they don't want to do certain things is a mm -hmm. lot of sisters that want to be feminine when it's time for them to be feminine right mm -hmm. but it's also a time when they have to have that masculine energy as well so it's like i'm 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 hopeful that you know people will be able to listen to you all show and come up with an understanding of what's going on with them and be able to understand some of the dynamics that you all are talking about 
and I really encouraged them to. So can you, you know, as we're closing it down, can you kind of tell them um, again, you know, how they can, you know, get a hold of your show, how they can be a part of your show and all that. Sure. And um, I, I do want to piggyback what you just said about the bias, um, especially when it comes to um, gender bias. Uh, I remember, oh, it's been so long since I taught the culture diversity class, but when I used to teach it, um, students, I would ask them on the first day, what are your bias? And of course, these are counseling students, so they would say, I don't have any. And I'd be like, okay, they want. <laughs> and so by the time you get to the week, you know, the second week or even the third week of class, those biases are now coming up because we're not aware about them. And so I go on to say that the problem isn't the bias, because we all have them. The problem is not being open to the fact that you have these biases. And so in relationships, it's the same thing. When you go into a relationship, whether you want to admit it or not, you have gender bias. You might want to believe I'm super open and we're equal opportunities, but at the end of the day, when the rubber meets the road, you have them. And so I, I really challenge people to think about what those biases are and to take a look to see, is this a stereotype that I have based on whatever learned experience, what I saw, modeling, my own belief system, um, and does it have to be that way? How, how is my own stereotyping or bias impacting my mate in some kind of way? Um, and, and can we get past that, right? Just because she's the female in the relationship doesn't mean that she has to cook. So are you having problems with your wife not cooking because of your gender stereotyping about that? Or, you know, even if it's a woman who has some particular stereotype, right? Are you upset that your husband don't cut the grass um, because you think that's masculine? Or because he just got bad allergies, like you're trying to kill him. So I think if you can become aware about those biases, you can start changing them if you acknowledge them. And um, our show comes on Sundays at um, 4 o'clock Central, uh, 2 o'clock Western, uh -huh, and uh, 5 o'clock uh, East Coast. And you can either listen live and you can call in if you have a question or you could um, listen online. And so the call-in phone number is 914-205-5901. Um, okay. That's how they can catch the show. Well, I'd like to thank you two for coming on and um, sharing your perspectives with us and talking about everything. Hopefully I could bring you all back another day. <laughs>